Sunday night. A lot to do tonight. First thing we'll do is we'll worship the Lord together in song. Let's stand if we would. And let's turn to page 415 in the songbook, 415. And we'll sing unto the Lord. Brother Tom. <laughs> tonight we we have our children in uh, missionary dress of the different fields that our church sponsors or uh, supports all over the world and each child will represent a given area some child uh, coming forward will represent maybe one missionary while others will represent five or six in one particular area of the world so uh, they practiced hard they're all dressed up and ready to go and we're going to let them do their children's missionary march. And when they're done, they're going to get ready for a song. And they'll be a special for us as well. Are the children ready yet? Are they ready yet? I don't think so. They're probably on a march coming in the building. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say a few other things while they're getting ready. Uh, let me get my Bible here. Uh, we had good service this morning, good start of our mission conference. Brother Daniel Brown brought a very thoughtful message and laid the foundation of this week's conference. And I hope that you come each and every night, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. And we ha also have special music each night. We look forward to what the Lord has for us as a church. And uh, just some things here that I, I announced this morning, I'll announce again. Uh, remember that our our vote comes up November 8th we should vote and get out there if you're not registered if you know people that need to hear more about the proposals and the vote please be much in prayer and again these proposals are not good ones and so uh, especially all of them but proposal three is really not good we believe in life and uh, not death so uh, remember to and also, you can go online. There's different sources, myvotecounts.org. We've announced that. And uh, Brother Levesque is with us tonight, Brother Josh Levesque. His father, Dr. Doug Levesque, uh, he pastored for 25 years at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And here's where John and Joanne Ashley are members now. And he was there 25 years. And now he is the founder and director of BibleNations.org. If you go to that, that has much more to say about voting. I'm going to have him talk a little bit uh, when his son comes up tonight for us. But we've got a lot going on. Don't miss a night. And uh, let's see, are they ready yet? 
They're ready now. Okay. All right. Here we have our children's missionary march. They will sing a special, and then we'll have some more congregational singing. All right, children. All right. Representing Africa is Alex Todd. And he is representing our missionaries, Hannah Bennett, South Africa, Josh Clay, Mali, Tom Harmon, South America, Brandon Hegel Schwartz, East Africa, Daniel Lang, Nigeria, David Loadima, Togo, West Africa, Bob Mack, Mac, uh, Ivory Coast, and Ezra Oalabi, Nigeria, Nate Wright, Uganda. Australia and New Zealand is represented by Zeke Sharpetta, and he represents Ken Chapman to Australia, Jerry Judd, New Zealand, Josh Schwarga, New Zealand. Brazil and Colombia are represented by Evelyn McLaren, and she is representing Brian Lawson, Brazil, Keith Putman, Brazil, Vladimir Silveira, Brazil, and Aaron Vance, Columbia. Canada is represented by Billy Todd, our missionary Russell Mackay in Vancouver, British Columbia. Cambodia and China and Taiwan are represented tonight by Caleb Sharpetta. He represents Eric Turnbull, Cambodia, China, and uh, well, China, we have two names, but for security reasons, we'll not mention them at this time. Brian Buckley, Taiwan, and Adam Waltz, Taiwan. Abdel Todd is representing Deaf Ministry. Fred Adams, Sword Deaf College in Tennessee, Reggie Rempel, Harvest Deaf College in Georgia, Alan Snare, Evangelist to the Deaf. England, Scotland, and Ireland are represented tonight by Cody McLaren and Haven Halstead. They represent missionaries Robert Burkett, England, Andrew Day, Ireland, John McLennan, Scotland, Philip Tharp, Ireland, and Kevin Rowersma, United Kingdom. Grenada and Haiti are represented tonight by Bella Jones, and she is walking, representing Coco Chan, Grenada, Joel Desir, Haiti, Robinson, Grousseau, Haiti. India is represented tonight by Levi and Hudson Molder. They represent Cindy Ann Raskina to Indian and Zachary Warner to India. Israel is represented by Carson Soper. Brother Bill Dillon and his wife minister there. Japan is represented tonight by Ania Watson, and she represents Alan Minks and Dan Robert. Liechtenstein in Germany tonight is represented by Elizabeth Wright. And she represents missionary Daniel Brown to Liechtenstein in Germany, Jeremiah Cooley to Liechtenstein, Robert Hornung to Germany. Mexico is represented tonight by Trent McLaren, and Trent represents Richard Comer, Humberto Gomez, Robert Hawk. Tonight, our missionaries in the Middle East are represented by Gabe Jones. He is representing Mark Bachman in Turkey, Chris Phillips in Kazakhstan, and Iraq. Again, our names are withheld due to security. The military ministries are represented by Eli Sharpetta, and he is representing Mr. Roger Hopgood. Panama is represented by Kenton Moeller, and he represents our missionary Ethan, Ethan Shields, who is a missionary pilot. 
and ministers also in the church. Papua New Guinea tonight is represented by Sadie Patterson, and she represents Brother John Allen, John Gray, and Reese Parfait. The Philippines are represented tonight by Gideon Sharpetta, and he happens to be representing his uncle, Tom Beeman, and Sister Jen that just went there just a month or so ago. So we're pleased for that addition to our mission program. Prison ministry is represented by Lucas Coyne, and he represents missionary Leroy DeMacellis with Rock of Ages Prison Ministry and Jim Jones, Rock of Ages Prison Ministry. Aris Todd, Todd will be representing Puerto Rico tonight, and she represents our missionary Andy Sharpetta and Robert Torado. Romania tonight is represented by Jaina McLaren, and she is representing Matthew Welsh to Romania. Spain is represented tonight by Leo Coyne, and he represents Marky Bullock and Francisco Puente. Owen Tullison tonight, fine-looking preacher man, is representing Bible Printing and Church Planting Ministries. First Bible International, Bob Ford, Very Precious Seed, John Green, Local Church Publishers, and Jeff Kruchko, Mongolia Mission Graphic. Also representing home missionaries, AAA Crisis Pregnancy Center of Livonia, John Ashley, In Spite of Ministries, Mike Childers, Clarksville, Arkansas Pastor, Christian Law Association, David Gates, The Arabs of America in Dearborn, Dan Hyden, New York Russian Jews, Jason Kendrick, Evangelism, Tent Ministry, Terry Kendrick, Evangelism Church Helps, Josh Levesque, Dearborn Baptist Church, Dearborn, Dave Ryburn, Montrose, Colorado, Hector Sharpetta, Warren, Michigan, Ronnie Starr, Native Americans in Florida, and Barry Williams, field, represent, field representative for BEMA. Retired missionaries are represented also, Ron Corley, New Mexico, Navajo Indians widow, Widows, is Grace Wilson tonight. She is representing the following widows. When we have one of our workers go to be with the Lord, we continue to support their widow. And Grace is representing Jacqueline Fuller. Uh, she is the widow of Bob Fuller, military to Germany. Peggy Rice, Ronnie Rice is wife in deaf ministry, Elaine Rogers, missionary Don Rogers of Mexico, and Carol Woodley, uh, widow to Chris Woodley, Philippines. These young people represent all the different fields we represent as a local church body, somewhere near 80 missionaries that we support, and we're hoping that we can do more. Also, we're hoping that we increase mission support in the near future give it a raise and uh, they definitely need it with cost of living and things raising through COVID and just being in one place for some time and needing extra funds to carry on their ministry and also help with their own personal and family needs. So the children are going to sing a song for us and we think that we'll give them a hand when they're all done, but they've been doing a good job tonight. Okay. All right, children, go ahead and pardon me. Oh, you want me to look at you? Oh, the children. I'm sorry. I thought you were trying to get my attention. All right, we'll have the children sing. Thank you. 
people. Then they do a great job. Give them another hand for their work tonight. Also, I want to thank the workers that got them ready. It's a process. It's a lot of work. And also our children's ministry uh, servants here at the church, junior church and Sunday school and master club and, of course, vacation Bible school, outreach for children. Thank all of you to get involved in those ministries. And it, these children are being discipled in these programs. And we believe in the full commission of Christ going all the world Tell them about Jesus, baptizing them, and also teaching them. That's discipleship, and the children are being discipled by our children's ministry staff here at the church. So thank for all you do. Let's stand again. We're going to go into the next part of the service, singing number 45. Number 45, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, and then we'll carry on with the rest of the service. Brother Tom. to the service tonight, 454. <laughs>
something else special we like to do tonight. We've got so much going on, but I think it's an exciting time. I think Mission Conference is more exciting than any other meeting of the year. And I enjoy our tent meeting. It's always wonderful. And we, have, we just had a Bible Antiquities Conference in the spring. That was exciting. But I love missions, and that really is the focal point of a New Testament church. So uh, I'm excited about tonight. I'm excited about the next three nights. Uh, Mrs. Julia Mulder is going to do a missionary reading tonight. And uh, let's all pay attention uh, to what she has to tell us tonight. Julia, if you'd come, please. Tonight, I'll be reading excerpts from the life of the missionary, Dr. Ida Sofa Shooter. Nebraska farm life was a dream to the seven-year-old Ida. There was wide open fields to run through, sweet smelling hay to play in, and the most beautiful horse to take care of. These happy days on the farm almost made her forget what had happened a year ago in India. Almost, but not quite. It was those children's eyes that be forever etched up in her memory. There was rows and rows and rows of pain-filled eyes all looking to her for relief. The eyes were so weak, they could scarcely be opened. Eyes so full of hunger they were longing to be satisfied. Even though Ida's basket was full of bread, she could only give them enough to really satisfy their hunger, not enough to really satisfy their hunger. Her mother had been clear about that. Only one chunk of bread, Ida. Just one chunk of bread for each child. Otherwise, those in the back will get nothing. It was hard, but Ida obeyed her mother. One chunk of bread wouldn't satisfy those poor children in the India's fama, but famine, but at least their tummies wouldn't rumble so much during the Bible story. That evening, as Ida looked at her own dinner, she felt guilty for having so much when they had so little. But all that was behind Ida now, that her missionary family had returned to America because of her father's poor health. She loved the comforts of America, where there always seemed to be plenty of food to go around. Ida decided that she would never return to India. She wanted the life that was easy and to be in the land of plenty. College dreams. The girls giggled as they crowded in the secret meeting place. The furnace room was the perfect spot for the bunch to examine their loot. Florence had borrowed the headmistress pen. Annie had borrowed the pot from the school kitchen. I've got you all beat. I've got the screws from the front gate. Wait till the headmistress walks through. With that, the entire group dissolved into laughter. Borrowing and later returning the items was just one of the many pranks the bunch had pulled during their four years at Twilight Moody Seminary for girls. But now that graduation was nearing, the girls' thoughts turned towards marriage and settling down. Ida, too, had dreams of securing life with her own Prince Charming in America but her dreams were interrupted by bad news. Her parents had returned to work in India, and her father needed her to come and take care of now her mother, who was quite ill. <clears throat> You're going to be a missionary just like your parents, teased Florence. Ida's anger flared. Oh, no, I won't. I'll never be a missionary. You'll see. I'll be back in a year. A change in plans. Once back in India, 21-year-old Ida helped her parents with missionary work but she secretly planned her escape. One evening, Ida had settled into her room to enjoy a book. As she turned the pages, her mind drifted from her plans to return to America and marry Mr. Wright and live out her days of luxury. But it was interrupted by a knock and some quick footsteps. They brought her back to the present and she looked up to see a young Hindu man trying to get her attention. <sighs> My wife is about to have her baby, but something's wrong. I was told you could help me. I'm no doctor, but my father is. He'll help your wife. The young man's face fell in sadness. Our religion doesn't permit a man to even look at my wife's face. I'd implored, but my father will help you. Let him help you or she'll die. 
in disbelief, Ida watched the man turn around and walk away, whispering, all is lost. That night, another Hindu man came to Ida with the same request. He refused her father's help for the same reason. A Muslim man also came seeking for his pregnant wife. If you can't help me, then it's better that my wife just die than her to be seen by a strange man. With that, he bowed and left. Ida spent a sleepless night praying for guidance. She felt that she met God that night, and he was calling her to abandon her plans and follow him. The next morning, Ida learned that all three of those women did die during the night. The senseless deaths occurred all because there was no female doctor. As a little girl, Ida had not enough bread to feed the starving children. But now, she knew there was a way she could help those hurting women in India. Ida prayed out loud, God, if you want me here in India, I will spend the rest of my life serving you, and I will help these women. Once she chose to follow God's call, Ida never looked back. She returned to America to attend Cornell Medical College, and in 1899, Dr. Ida Scooter was ready to begin her work in India. Medication to the people. Ida examined a large open sore on the boy's leg. Why didn't you bring him in sooner? She asked his mother. Ida was thrilled that the women were finally trusting her to bring her, their families to the clinic, but sometimes they waited too long. I thought it was the image of God growing there, replied the mother. Everyone told me I would anger the gods even if I touched it. Can you help him? But sadly, it was too late. Their superstitions, the people believed, that kept them from coming in time. She had to think of a way to resolve the problem, and finally she did. Ida's roadsies were the answer. She took an ox and a wagon full of medicine supplies. Ida would travel to remote villages, and she would not only treat the people there for their physical illnesses, but she would treat their spiritual illnesses as well. She would share Christ with them and pray with those that she visited and answer any questions she'd have about Jesus or Christianity. The last thing that Ida did is she set her in her mind to not only heal their illnesses there, but to train Indian women as nurses and doctors so they could help themselves. Though no one believed that women could be able to pass the final doctor's exam, Ida pressed on. When the scores were finally tallied, 14 of her students had passed. Ida's dreams of teaching Indian women to help themselves became a reality. Ida helped start the Valora Christian Medical College and Hospital, which is today known around the world for excellent research, health care, and disease prevention. Their Bible classes are held in nine different languages. Chaplains pray with the patients, and Dr. Ida Scooter, who once promised never to work in India, left a legacy that continues to touch millions today. call was answered. Superstition kept people from hearing the gospel and being saved. I told that story, my mind went back to a trip we took to New Mexico among the Navajo Indians. And the missionary that had been there so faithfully was asked a question from one of our young people. At that time, that young person was learning sign language and how to reach the deaf and asked the missionary, if they would run into any deaf Indians along the way as we went from Hogan to Hogan. And he said, you won't meet any deaf in the Indian community because the Indians are so superstitious of people that are deaf. And they'll take their deaf children and babies out to the desert and let them die by the elements. That's so sad to hear. But when we were going door knocking in the Indian villages, that very afternoon, one of our young people studying deaf met a deaf young boy, a deaf Navajo. And that young man just listened to everything that young person had to say. And the young person was so excited that she got to minister to that young man. But it just reminded me of superstition. Julia, thank you for that. That was so wonderful and that God led her to give her life on the foreign field to reach people for Jesus Christ. But our missionaries, they have a lot of challenges where they go in the world to reach people that are in darkness and their lives are consumed by superstition and falsehood. And so pray for our missionaries as they're on the field trying to reach people to Christ. There's a lot of barriers, amen. Thank you, Julia, we enjoyed that. Thank you so much. At this time, a little different tonight, I like the difference. 
I'm going to have Brother Josh Levesque come. Brother Josh is now pastoring in Dearborn, Dearborn Baptist Church. He's going to give us a report of that. And then uh, have your dad say a few words at the end, if you would. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for your work. Amen. God bless you. Well, thank you, Pastor Brown. Thank you all for having us back here today. Uh, feels like it's been a long time, probably just over a year since we were last here. And uh, we, a lot has happened in one year. And so we have a lot of exciting things to report. Uh, but my name is Josh Levesque, and minister in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, just over one year ago, we moved to Dearborn and have had the privilege to start the Dearborn Baptist Church. And we just celebrated one year of Dearborn Baptist Church last month in September. And our first year has, has gone by so quickly, and some incredible things have happened. We spent our first nine months as a portable church, meeting at the Double Tree Inn on Ford Road and Southfield Freeway, and packing up into a trailer, unpacking every week. Uh, thankfully, the Lord gave us some great helpers during that time uh, to handle a lot of the labor and energy that it took to have church in a hotel. Uh, but the Lord didn't have us there for long, uh, well beyond our expectations and well ahead of our uh, expected schedule, uh, the Lord provided for us to move out of the hotel. We set that as a goal at the beginning of the year, not knowing how the Lord would do it. Uh, but in January, we were approached by a group that wanted to help us finance some property. And uh, certainly unexpected in year one to be able to do something like that. Um, but the Lord uh, kind of gave it to us right at the right time. And we went shopping. We went searching and found a beautiful property right in the middle of Dearborn. It's a historic church building. Uh, just under six acres of property, buildings of about 10,000 square feet. And uh, the listing price was well outside the range we were able to ask, even with the help of outside groups. Um, but praise God, the group came down well over half their asking and uh, wanted to sell it to a church. It was a church that was kind of on, on uh, closing down at the time. And so the Lord allowed us to purchase that property, and we were able to move in July and we spent all summer renovating, promoting a grand opening. And uh, we had a grand opening of a new property in Dearborn on our first anniversary. And uh, only God could have done something like that in Dearborn, where the, the property is uh, way outside of our reach. And uh, especially a property of the nature that we have. It's a beautiful place and uh, something we did not imagine uh, we would ever be able to minister in a place like this in the city of Dearborn. Uh, the building has done some incredible things for us. Uh, not only have we not had to pack our church up into a trailer every week, which is a blessing, um, but we've been able to see so many more people come into the church. We had uh, 117 people come to our grand opening service uh, back in September. Uh, we've continued to have good attendances ever since. We've had new visitors, I could say this, new visitors every week since our grand opening. Uh, just a steady stream of people from the community coming in, finding out what's going on. Uh, this morning was an especially exciting day. Not only was it a beautiful fall day, and I'm sure you all enjoyed that as well, uh, but we were able to have our second ever baptism service this morning. And we baptized three, and we had five people join the church, uh, which uh, was uh, so exciting. And uh, even in that, I have some other um, blessings to share with you. Uh, just from this morning's service, uh, we did have a few newcomers, but among the newcomers... Uh, a, a Yemeni man named Naji uh, had planned to visit online. I, I had seen the email come in and never know whether those people are going to show up anyways when they plan online, but I was expecting someone, not sure who, but uh, Naji came this morning. He sat and he heard the preaching and I got to talk to him after the service. We were having a baptism. I said, stick around and watch the baptism. I want you to see it. And I, I took a minute to just explain to him what baptism is, what it represents and he watched the baptism service, and afterwards I got to speak with him, and he said, can I be baptized? And this is a man who grew up in a Muslim home and uh, wants to be baptized. And I explained to him, Najee, baptism means that you believe in Jesus. It means you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. And he said, yes, I want to be baptized. So praise God. That's just some fruit that, um, again, is something we'd been praying for, uh, that we would see some people come from the Muslim community, from the Yemeni community, and come into the church. And it's something we had been working hard for, but something that the Lord just did. <laughs> uh, sometimes we think, oh, it's going to be so much work and we're going to have to do all of these things to see it happen. And yet uh, we see that the Lord is capable of building his church anywhere in the world. And uh, I was so encouraged by that this morning just to see some of that fruit start to come in in that 
form. And uh, we, as, as we were packing up the baptistry, draining the pool and uh, packing it up, we had another man stop by. He said, I, I've been saved for a couple years, and I know that I need to be baptized. Can I come join your church and be baptized? And uh, it's, it's just amazing what the Lord's been doing and uh, continuing to build his church. And we owe so much to all of you and to many churches like yours who have a heart for missions and are willing to financially support missionaries and church planters. And uh, we have been so strongly supported. It's allowed us to move into this property, do some incredible renovation over the summer, and uh, get it ready to go, purchase the things that we need uh, to man a facility. And uh, the Lord has just continued to give us all of the things that we need and continue to show us the way and uh, continue to teach us that God can do the impossible. And our, our faith has grown so much during this time that as I am sitting now kind of at the end of year one, thinking about, well, what is year two and what is year three going to be? Uh, I can't even imagine what, what the Lord is going to do. Year one has so far exceeded our expectations, and uh, we're looking forward to the Lord doing some even more amazing things in the coming years. And we're so thankful for all of our partners in the gospel, uh, especially those of you that are here in the, in the metro area and uh, know what the community is in Dearborn and I know have a real heart for the community there. So I, I just ask that you continue to pray for us. Um, pray that the Lord will provide and pray that the Lord will continue to give us some strategic contacts in the city, uh, that we see people continue to come to faith and be baptized. And uh, we're in a strategic place in a strategic time, I believe. Uh, Dearborn has been a political hotbed. It's all over the national news right now. And we've had some opportunities to possibly get into that debate as far as the, the books and the, and the public schools and the libraries and and all of those things that are going on in Dearborn. And uh, even some of the Muslim community have reached out and said, will you stand with us against some of these things? And so we've had some unique opportunities uh, to make some connections with even some of the Muslim leaders in the community, but take a strong Christian stand and uh, show, show, show uh, what we believe and that we are willing to stand for it uh, just as much. And so pray for us as we're in that position that we would have uh, wisdom to take those opportunities uh, and, and be wise in that. And uh, that it might be something that might increase the gospel in the city of Dearborn, and uh, that the Lord would just continue to build his church as we've seen him do. I preached this morning from the book of Jonah, and uh, Jonah, when he was in the whale, uh, prayed a beautiful prayer, a beautiful psalm to God, and, and cried out for deliverance. And the closing of his prayer, he finally acknowledged the truth that salvation is of the Lord. And that's the lesson from the book of Jonah, is that God can save anyone. God gets to choose how salvation works, who gets to be saved, who gets to hear the gospel, and praise God that he's opened that door wide open. It's for everyone. It's for the whole world. And so we've been just thrilled to be able to be uh, your co-laborers in the city of Dearborn and so appreciate your mission's heart and uh, appreciate this church. We pray that God continues to bless all of you and that uh, we are able to represent this church well in the ministry there at Dearborn Baptist Church. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. I'm um, excited to have my dad along with me tonight, and uh, he was able to be with us for baptism services this morning in Dearborn, and uh, he runs the Bible Nation Society. They have a great podcast that's just started that talks about a lot of these cultural issues from a biblical perspective, and so Pastor Brown invited him as well to come give you a little update and uh, some of the upcoming topics that they'll be covering as well. I'm Dr. Doug Levesque. I'm Josh's dad. <laughs> More and more, I'm Josh's dad everywhere. So praise the Lord. When you bring your kids to missions conference and you raise them to love the Lord and you kind of send their direction, uh, you don't know what they're going to end up being. They might tell you one day, I'm going to Dearborn to plant a church, amen, or, or wherever. And so I wasn't sure about Josh going to Dearborn, amen. I gave him support. I gave him an AR-15 and uh, <laughs> said, good luck, son, with all that. But man, he loves people. He loves all kinds of people. And the church is just getting all kinds of people uh, in there. Praise the Lord. And um, it's great. I travel. I've been in 300 churches the last uh, seven years. And um, so many independent Baptist churches are not King James. But I'm glad to be in a King James church. I just wanted to say that because you don't get to say that everywhere. Amen. And um, I love it. People come to Josh's church and they're from all different cultures. And they're like, well, why the King James Bible? <laughs> Amen. So he's got multiple ministries there. But uh, in pastoring in Owasso for all those years, we decided uh, that we really needed to teach government and civics through the scriptures. And um, so 
uh, we started the Bible Nation Society. BibleNation.org is the website. This is our second year having a podcast. I've written six books. I've co-written with some people. There's other books on there. Brother Ashley's books are published through the Bible Nation Society as well. And um, really, you know, this book is, tells you how to be saved. It tells you how to run a church. Uh, it, it tells you how to start a church. It tells you how to be married and what marriage and family is about. This also tells you what a nation is, what a nation's for, what government is about. It's also that. I wrote a book called The Design and Destiny of Nations. It comes right from Scripture. Scripture tells you what a nation is, what a government is, what it's supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be serving God. Did you know that? <laughs> and um, so we go around to churches, and we help them with their civics and, uh, and explain uh, the Bible in cultural events. Isaiah 26.2 says, Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Amen. And so I challenge you to go to Bible Nation, singular, Bible Nation, singular, dot O-R-G, and check out our books, thousands of articles, and uh, our podcast as well. We just this week are releasing podcasts on uh, Proposition 1 and 2 is one podcast, and then Proposition 3 as well. And we do about a half hour on each one of those podcasts. And so uh, many churches are not knowledgeable and are not proactive like this church. So I probably don't need to be preaching to this church, but go on there and check that out and vote no <laughs> on, uh, on the proposition. Free country, vote however you want, but vote no, okay, and uh, on those um, propositions. And I just want to say thank you for supporting my son in missions and love the fact that you guys are, are right here reaching out in prayers and support and all kinds of people even going over working on the buildings and things like that. So I'm so grateful. Pastor, we love you. Thank you very much. That'd be wonderful. Well, at this time, we're going to have uh, John McLaren and his wife. Not the family, just husband and wife. Okay. And uh, Kirsten, they're going to sing. And then we're going to move on in the service. We'll get our offering together here. And so, men, if you'll get ready for that. Okay. Thank you. Oh uh-huh. 
come, we'll take up our offering this evening. And Brother Daniel, if you'll come get ready to preach while they're coming. Uh, the offerings, of course, are a regular Sunday night offering for the church, and so make sure you mark your offering. It, at the end of the service, we'll take up an offering for the conference speakers. But uh, last Saturday, I had stopped over at Costco. I thought I'd pick up just a few items quickly. Well, it was a very long line, and as you're in line, you have people in front of you and behind you and start a conversation. There was a, a black family behind me who were Muslim, and I began talking to them, and uh, they weren't really friendly at first, but I asked enough questions. They told me they were from Gambia, and I asked them how long they had been here, and they said for eight years. And he asked me who I was, and I told him that I was a, a local church pastor in Livonia, that I was a Christian, and that I said, I'm interested you being from Gambia because my son pastors a church in Germany, and some of the Gambian men had been saved, and now we're following Christ. He thought that was very interesting. And we talked in line for quite a while, and uh, pray, I asked him to come. He said he might come to hear my son, since my son was a missionary uh, and had helped Muslim people. So I don't know if they'll come. I thought they might come here today, but I'm hoping they will. But uh, then the people, uh, we, we switched lines. You know how they have long lines and you're made to go a different direction. And I got with another family that were behind me, but they weren't Muslim. They weren't uh, uh they were just common, ordinary people. But we were talking, I gave him a gospel track. The husband did not like it that I gave his wife a gospel track. But then as we talked and talked, he listened and he was a construction worker and they said that they may visit as well. So I say that to say this, you know, pray for that couple from Gambia. She was expecting, they have three children and it seemed to be an interest there that my son had a connection in Germany. And so that, and then this other family that said that they may visit. Now, I know we get in a lot of conversations with people, but you never know when they might come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But uh, Daniel, of course, will be coming to preach here in a moment. He has a very unusual church, very eclectic church of a lot of different uh, people from different countries. It's so exciting to go there and see what's going on. But let's take up our offering, then we'll have Daniel come. Maybe he can give us a little report and get into his message, okay? Brother Tom Smith, would you pray for the offering, sir? Amen. Thank you, Brother John. pastor in Leutkirk, Germany. He and other men have, have worked together in Rhine Valley Project, and he can explain that to you through the week. But uh, uh, Daniel, again, he has a very unique ministry over there. We have some of our people have gone and seen that, a lot of refugee work, and uh, of course the German people as well. 
So Daniel, come and share a little bit, and then go ahead and preach what you have on your heart tonight. And Brother Levesque, I understand there was a day where I was Pastor Brown, and then there came a day where I was Daniel Brown's dad, and that's where I'm at. I understand that. Okay. Well, amen. I enjoyed hearing from Brother Josh, and uh, I got to meet him in summer, and uh, I have to tell this, we, we met at the coffee shop, and he was not planning on, or he didn't know if he was coming to the tent meeting or not, I don't know, I don't remember if he'd heard about it, but I said, Let's, we're, we're going to the tent meeting tonight, why don't you come, what should I wear, right? And I said, I'm not going to wear a tie, don't wear a tie, I, you know, just come. And so he came, and of course, against better advice, he didn't wear a tie. He should have wore a tie, because <laughs> dad called him up to pray. And here he is, a liberal, you know, not wearing a tie. I don't even know if your prayer got through, to be honest with you. <laughs> but <laughs> so, but I, I really enjoy, and I hope we get to spend some more time fellowshipping with him. I have to tell you, Park, if you just being... Uh, in the part of the world that we're in, experiencing ministry with different cultures, if we, if we moved back here, I'd be tempted to split my membership with, between Parkview and Dearborn Baptist because I just love being around the different cultures and seeing, uh, I mean, when you get everybody to singing together, it doesn't always sound great. It doesn't always, you know, it's not always the best sounding music, but it's such a reflection of that scene in heaven before the throne. And that's, it's wonderful. And so I'm very, praising the Lord, very thankful for what God is doing over there in Dearborn. And uh, glad that we, as we are members and we support missions here, so glad that we have some small part in that. And uh, yes, the, most of you know, probably all of you know, uh, that the ministry in Lloyd Kirk was started the opposite of the, the way a typical German ministry is started. When we tell the German Christians how our, our church started, they just... They're like, that's weird. But we, we actually began uh, by reaching refugees. And it wasn't a plan, but we started reaching the refugees because they were the needy people around and uh, they were open to hearing what we had to say. So we started with them. And from that small handful of refugees, they then reached out into the German community. And uh, actually the first people that came would have been invited by African, uh, so Nigerian African refugees into our, in, into our little Bible studies. And so now there is a, a multicultural German-speaking church. And uh, I will say, I, I'm very thankful for the furlough. We did the furlough back in the summer, three and a half months. That was the first furlough we'd done in eight years. Um, and it was so good. It was really, um, even though it was a short amount of time for a furlough, we were, we were blessed and encouraged by it, refreshed. I don't think we realized how much we needed it um, until we been here and then even gotten back. And I was reading just recently where Elijah, the angel of the Lord, uh, fed Elijah, and it says he went in the strength of that food for 40 days. And uh, we, you know, just this period of we've been back, what, a, a month and a half or something like that, but been just so refreshed and encouraged and uh, sort, of, sort of a new perspective, try, trying to help the church transition away from us, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, but that furlough was very helpful to get us where we needed to be. And uh, so this first year, brother, uh, exciting, powerful, save all of that up, uh, like, that, like the, the food that the angel of the Lord gave to Elijah, because there will be some, obviously some times that are uh, challenging, but God gives us these, these breaks and these uh, blessings to keep us going. Uh, very thankful for that. Uh, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to... John 17. John chapter 17, yes. And um, I'll be honest, I mean, the easiest way for me to do a series is just stay, you know, stay right here in the same chapter and uh, let the Lord's word speak for itself. Um, I, I was able to speak with Dina today. They watched the service uh, and were in on it. And uh, is it just encouraging to see different, uh, the different reactions to this morning? I, I have to be honest. I didn't know if the majority of you were with me, half of the service, and then I've had some feedback this morning that some people have been listening and they understood and it was helpful to them and I praise the Lord for that. You see, this, this found, these foundational truths, um, they're, they're, they're vital. 
And building a foundation is not, it's not fun. It's the, back, the back-breaking work. It's not pretty necessarily. It's not, you know, all, it's not the, the big structure. But if you don't have that, then everything else just falls apart. And it's so very important that when we're talking about world evangelism, when we're talking about our part in it, that we go back to those foundational truths again and again and again. And I was thinking again this morning, just the gospel message itself. How often do we come to God in prayer and, and we're discouraged and defeated or maybe feeling guilty about not being where we ought to be as Christians and we sort of just push through, but wouldn't it be helpful to go back to the foundational truth of the gospel? Just preach the gospel to yourself. Christ died for me. He rose again from the grave and I am in Christ. And all of those things that distract me from being what I ought to be, they're not so insurmountable and they're not so great of a thing if I just go back to that foundational truth of the gospel. So we have to continually do these things. And so we've done the hard work, I think. Uh, of course, probably not a good enough job, but we've, we've gone back and we've laid the foundation, the starting point of missions. We found in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Missions begins with the eternal God back in eternity, before time ever was, that's where it starts. The Lamb of God foreordained before the foundation of the world. God's gospel message was way back then before time ever began. Now, we're going to go further into this prayer of the Lord Jesus, but I want us, before we read, we're going to read again. I don't know if I'll read the whole psalm, but, or the whole, uh, the whole prayer here, but Uh, We're going to read some more, but I want us to understand the context of this. I didn't really get into that this morning, but the context of John chapter 17 is this is right before Jesus is taken and crucified. Uh, There's some debate and discussion as to when exactly. Some people believe he prayed this uh, at at the Last Supper there, that while the disciples were there at the table, that he prayed it maybe before they sung the song and went out. Uh, If you read, we'll just go ahead and skip, look at verse 18 and verse 1. It says, when Jesus had spoke these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Kedron, uh, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. So it appears as if they're on their way. But here is Christ. Now, I'm trying to set the scene for you. Understand, Christ is with his disciples, most likely. They are within earshot of him, most likely as he's praying these words. He's about to be taken. Of course, he gives his life. No one takes his life, but he is taken by soldiers. He gives his life on the cross. He's about to give his life, raised from the grave. Then he gives that great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This prayer is very much a benediction. It's a prayer of blessing. It's a prayer that is very significant. What he's about to pray here, this is what he wants God the Father to do for his followers, for his church, as he's departing off of the scene, at least uh, physically speaking. He's not physically here anymore, but he sends his spirit. So these are very significant words. In other words, the great commission that he gives after he raises from the grave, it goes on in the power of this prayer that Jesus is praying in John chapter 17. Very, very significant. You might have noticed this morning when we read that Jesus in this prayer, he excludes a very large portion of people from his prayer. Did anybody notice who he excluded? You didn't notice? Sorry? The, 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 the world. Jesus in this prayer is very interesting in verse number Uh, 9, the Bible says, Jesus says, I pray for them, that is, his followers. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. It's interesting, isn't it? We're talking about missions, so it would would go hand in hand that you think we should, Jesus here, of course he's praying for the world. 
please don't misunderstand me. There are definite portions of scripture where we're commanded to pray for the lost. Jesus did pray for laborers into the harvest. Paul said in Romans chapter number, uh, was it nine or 10? He said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they be saved. We must pray for the lost. But here in this very significant prayer, Jesus does not emphasize the world. Rather, he emphasizes his followers. It's very important. Not that the world is not affected. Notice if you'll turn, um, if you look back in verse number 15, I believe it is. Uh, look, look at, sorry, verse 14. He says, I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So here he keeps mentioning the world over and over and over again, but he's not praying for the world. He's sending them into the world, but he's not praying for the world. Now look at verse 23. We read, I and them, Jesus in his church, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me them as love them as thou hast loved me. I, here's just to, to the start here. I want us to understand Christ in this prayer is not praying for the world, but what he prays for his people helps us to be prepared and able to reach the world. And so what I want to do for tonight and tomorrow, Lord willing, is to emphasize the things Christ prays for his church, for his people. And we are included here. He says he prays for those who would believe on Christ through the word of the apostles or where the disciples there. And so that includes us. What he prays for us is very important to getting the gospel to the world. And so this first part of this, after we found, laid that foundation, is this issue and this subject of sanctification. Jesus Christ prays that his church would be sanctified. And through our sanctification, through our setting apart unto him, we will be able then and in a fit position to reach the world. So that's just the thesis statement. That's the sort of the starting. Now let's dig in and read it. We will go back to the start. John chapter 17 and verse number 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father... The hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep the, through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, 
And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as not, I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Let's pray, and we'll continue through the message. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for the word that was made flesh, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the eternal gospel that is centered around the eternal Son of God through which we can receive eternal life and join into this wonderful eternal love that exists in the Godhead. And Lord, I pray that you would please help us as a church, help us, Father, to get back to the foundational truths from which a solid missionary movement within our church can take place. I pray that you would do your work in our hearts. I pray that you would draw us closer to, to yourself. And I pray that Christ would be magnified in all that is said and done. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we need to understand that what Christ is doing here in this, in, in this chapter, in this prayer, is he is uh, absolutely praying for things that are vital to our effectiveness in this world. Everything that he's praying, if we want to see what, what God wants to do through his church, what Christ wants to do through his body, we look in this, church, in this chapter and we see it is sort of a synopsis of what he wants to accomplish in us and therefore through us. It's very, very important for us to, to notice all of these things that are in here. And so we notice he's not praying for the world, he's praying for us. He's praying for the church. Praise the Lord that he didn't stop praying for us. Some people call this passage the high priestly prayer, and I know there are some reasons for that, but the, re the reality is he didn't stop praying. He continues to intercede for us on our behalf. He's there and taking our prayers to the Father. And praise the Lord for this. We, he gets all of his prayers answered. This is wonderful. The Son gets all of his prayers answered. He's taking uh, on our behalf these prayers to the Father. And so, what is it that he's praying for? We, we notice a few things, but tonight I, I want to focus on this issue of sanctification. Sanctification is the setting apart of a thing or of self for God. In John chapter 17, this is really a small example, a small portion of the life of Christ, but it represents in this chapter everything that Jesus was about in his earthly ministry. All, everything that his life was about, it was a life of sanctification. I'm going to give just a few very simple points tonight. Again, we did all the digging this morning, and so tonight just a very simple thought with very simple points. But the first thing is we need to understand the importance of sanctification. The word sanctification, because of perhaps its misuse and abuse in religious circles, has lost its meaning. And many times when we hear this word automatically, like the word Trinity sometimes, it's just we turn it off. It's too complicated. It, it requires too much of me. We associate it with words like, what, legalism or whatever. Sanctification is wonderful. 
Sanctification is part of God's plan. Sanctification is absolutely vital to us accomplishing the, the, the command that God has given to us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It is foundational. So we have to understand it's important. How important is it? Look in verse number 19 in our chapter, in the prayer here. Verse 19, well, look at verse 18. It says, as, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Here's how important sanctification is. Christ's sanctification of himself to the will of the Father provides salvation for you and for me. If Jesus did not set himself aside to do the will of the Father, we have no salvation. That's how important it is. There is no salvation. There is no gospel. There is no world evangelism. If Christ does not set aside himself for the will of the Father. So it's very important. You cannot be a believer in Jesus Christ. A, we call ourselves Christians that's sometimes put into question. It's, that was really more of an accusatory term that was thrown on to Christians and they sort of accepted it gladly because they wanted to be identified with Christ. But we cannot be a true follower of Christ indwelt with the Holy Spirit and not be in some way sanctified to God. Why is that? Because God does that initial work of sanctification. When we place our faith in Christ, God does what we cannot do. And he takes that, that soul, he, ta he takes that individual, and he places them inside to Christ, of Christ. And what is that? Sanctification. He's setting us apart from the world to himself. We are sanctified because of the sanctification of Jesus Christ, because he set himself apart. It's very, very important. But it's also important on our end. In the book of Hebrews, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews, chapter number 12. Hold your spot in John. Just as we could not be saved if Christ did not sanctify himself, so we who are ambassadors in Christ's stead, representative of Christ, if we are not sanctified, others cannot be saved. I'll prove that from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. Hebrews chapter number 12. My Bible's, it's all, it's, it's all coming apart. So I'm trying to find. Hebrews chapter 12. I won't say who made the Bible because it would be bad advertising for people we know. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow people, peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That word holiness in other passages, first, for example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is translated sanctification. What does that mean? Right, right there he's saying if we don't have sanctification, if we are not set apart unto God, no man will see the Lord. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what the modern church movement is saying today, isn't it? The, the opposite message is being preached. We need to not sanctify ourselves so that others can see Jesus. I read something recently. It was the most ridiculous thing. It said, follow Jesus. Don't follow the Bible. Don't follow this, that. They're listing all of these fundamental truths, and of course the Bible. Just take a big breath and follow Jesus. It's impossible. You see... Sanctification is vital. We, if we don't separate ourselves unto the Lord, no one can see the true Jesus. They might see a form or a type of some worldly uh, type of Jesus, but it's not the true Christ, and it's not the one who can save, and it's not the one who can bring them into eternity. It's not the one that can change their life. It's very important. So number one, very simple point, the importance of sanctification. Christ must be sanctified for us to receive salvation. We as his ambassadors in this world, remember, we're entering into God's eternal plan. We must be sanctified for others.
to join into or to be able to be saved, to see Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, that because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, here it is, but unto him that died for them and rose again. Sanctification is, is very much us living unto him. So that's number one. Number two, the implications of sanctification. You could say maybe the requirements, but the implications. What is sanctification and how is it defined in the text? Let's deal with what it is not. Let's deal with what it, Jesus talks about what it's not. Look in verse number 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. It's interesting, as far as I could tell, there were two things that he did not pray for. Specifically, he prayed not for the world, and he specifically prayed not that God would take them out of the world. Now that contradicts a large portion of what we, many of us have come to believe about sanctification, doesn't it? Sanctification is not leaving the world. Not physically leaving the world, not practically leaving the world. Sanctification is very much us being in the world and at the same time being set apart unto God. And there's, there's a logical understanding that Paul deals with very specifically. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse number 9. Paul writes, and this is obviously dealing about sin within the church, right? He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. There it is. You probably should all just quit your jobs right now. No, he goes farther. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, extortioner with such and one no not to eat. What does he say? He's saying don't, you, you, you can't separate yourself from everybody in the world. It's not, it doesn't make any sense. It would be a contradiction in terms if he's saying go into the world and reach the gospel, but at the same time come out of the world and don't have anything to do with them. Now, we, we're nodding our heads, but this this gets really uncomfortable when you get into world evangelism. When you, when you allow people to enter into your home, to sit at your table, who don't use the same language that you allow in your home, who talk about things that, themes that maybe would make you squirm in your seat, especially when your kids are sitting there. But where to reach the world? Right? We're to go out into the world and reach them with the gospel. It makes us uncomfortable. So it's almost a contradiction in terms. But here Paul is explaining we have got to be in the world to reach the world. And at the same time, we ourselves are separated completely unto God. That would require for us then to invest in how we're teaching our children, wouldn't it? I'll be, you, you know our family, you know our children. Our children don't have any Christian friends. Sorry. And this might just blow some of your minds. Our kids don't go to a Christian school. You know why? It's illegal. They can't go to a Christian school in Germany. But God called us to go there. You know, there's a lot of missionaries, and I don't know them, and I can't judge their, but they, they've come off of the mission field. They say God sent them to because their kids have to go to a public school. When the public school, they teach their children's here, ch children here, but they teach things that we would not want our children to learn from other people. Things that moms and dads should be teaching their kids. All right, we understand? But God called us there. So what are we gonna do? 
I just recently heard a message with somebody talking about Titus and Timothy, the, the requirements of a pastor, and using this for uh, saying a pastor was unqualified to be a pastor because his adult child was not living for God. I'm thinking that that is taken so far out of context. And what he said was, did you send them to a public school? Well, that's the most ridiculous thing. No, we, what do we do? We invest ourselves into our children. We invest ourselves into our family so that they know Christ, so that we can actually be a light to the world around us. So it's very important that we understand what sanctification is not. I'll get off the soapbox. I am kind of, I'm up, I'm on a pedestal, literally. So, but this is important. We understand what it's not. Colossians chapter 2, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is Christ. Colossians 2 verse 20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which, all, uh, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now, don't get me wrong. I, all I did was read scripture. That's all I did. But I know some, Daniel doesn't believe in separation. No, I believe very much in separation. I believe in biblical separation and sanctification. But Paul is writing here and he's saying, sanctification is not about what you don't do. It is not about all of the things that you have this list of check, it's a checklist, but it's never ending things that I'm not involved in. Sanctification is very much that I am completely and utterly sold out to Christ. So this is what it's not, but what is it? So I've just sort of given my definition, but let's look at what Christ said in John 17. He gives us a perfect example of what sanctification is. John chapter 17, let's begin, and we're gonna go backwards from the end of this prayer all the way up to the beginning. Verse 26, Jesus says, I have declared unto them thy name. He's speaking to the Father and will declare it. Here we have Christ saying, my ministry is to declare thy name. Look at verse 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have not known thee, and, and these have known that thou hast sent me. What is this? This is he has done God's will. Thy name, thy will. Verse number 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In verse number 14, he says, I have given them thy word. In verse number 10, he says, all mine are thine and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. This is thy people. It's God's people. I have glorified, verse four, excuse me, verse four, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Thy work, thy glory. Verse number one, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. What is sanctification? Jesus said very, not, I don't, of course it's all intentional, but as you walk back through this, you see that Jesus is saying to the Father, everything that I'm doing, everything that I am is you. It's for you. Sanctification is not a ceremonial de uh, dedication. It's more than portions of my life that I allocate to God at certain periods of time in my life. Jesus makes clear that his identity Son, the Son of God, is wrapped up in the Father. It's the name and character he, he declared, the Father's will he fulfilled, the truth he proclaimed, the word he gave, the people that he led, the glory he possessed, his very self. He said, it's all for you, Father. So what does sanctification mean for you and me? It's the very same thing. All that we are surrendered to the Lord to the will of the Heavenly Father. This is what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 1. 
Paul writes, moreover, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. This is what we learned about in Sunday school this morning. They were very, they were poor. They did not have a lot of money, and yet somehow they were able to give to help the needs of the churches, uh, of other churches, the churches in Jerusalem. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped or not as we had expected, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. So when we get down to, you know, where the rubber meets the road, missions conference, we all think, of course, automatically of money. But it doesn't begin with money. It doesn't even begin with a missionary being sent out or with us taking tracts or whatever. It begins with us giving our own self to the Lord. That is sanctification. Christ is our example. And if Christ could do it, the one who is co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father, then certainly you and I can do that, couldn't we? Take your songbooks out. I've got a song, 611. It's a great song. We know this song. It's a great example of what sanctification looks like. Francis Ridley Havergale. Let's look through this song. song. Song 611. Take my life and let it be. Read the words and think on what she's saying here. Take my life and let it be consecrated, dedicated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands. Let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Verse 3, take my voice and let me sing always, only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Verse 4, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Verse 5, take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Verse 6, take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet his treasure store, take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Very practical, gets into our everyday life, everything, my dreams, my goals, my family, my children, my marriage, all of it belongs to God, sanctification. If the church, we're almost done, okay, if the church, if, if you, are not sanctified. You will not be that solid foundation from which missions goes forth. It can't happen. Because a church that is somehow living for self will never truly go with the right motivation or with the right heart, with the right enthusiasm, with the right... Uh, what, what's the word? I was telling Dad this morning, my English is just... I, I have a hard time finding words. Stick to itness. That's, it's not even the right word, but it, it, it sums it up, right? We're not going to go with that if we are not sanctified unto the Lord. So how do we get sanctified? Jesus gives us the answer. The inspiration of our sanctification. Where can we be sanctified? Of course, we're sanctified in that Christ gave himself for us. Those who are saved are automatically placed inside of Christ. God sanctifies us. But look in verse number 17. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Now, I, I want to speak to this just for a second. This isn't the message. But there's an element of our society, even with Christians, where we sort of cower at a statement like that. To say that the Bible, God's word, is absolute truth, it's just not intellectual enough. But the reality is, if this is not absolute truth, 
you have no foundation. Your Christian faith is really, it's just as good as any other religion in the world. And the resurrection of Christ is called into question. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. Either, either it's true or it's not. Jesus said, your word is truth. Truth is foundational. It's found, it, it, if, if it's not based upon God's word, it, it can, must be called into question. And so Jesus says we're sanctified through the word of God. Our sanctification is entirely contingent upon the place God's word has and holds in our lives. So we look in verse number 8. Verse 8, it says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. So this word was a received word. Jesus gave them the words, they received them. And it's, it go, he goes farther, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So this word of God was given by Christ and received by his disciples. What does that mean? Believed. The word of God brings salvation. It was a received word. It's a regenerating word. How do we know that? In verse number 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world even as I am out of the world. What was it that called the disciples, caused them to not be like the world anymore? The Word. Jesus gave them the Word, and the Word changed them. Not a, a, a transformation, turning over a new leaf, or any of those things you might say. He made them completely new. He gave them a new nature. We are now in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. He goes on in, this, in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, even our relationships, he says, yet know we no man more after the flesh. What is that? Our, our relationships, everything about us has changed because Christ has made us new. We are new creation. How? Through the word of God. Because we've not been redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold, but by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Being born again by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. So this is a received word. And as we receive the word, God regenerates us and he makes us a new creation. And then we see in verse number 17, following their receiving the word, Jesus already acknowledged that, following the fact that they are a new creation, he says again in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. What is this? This is a repeated word. In other words, it's great that you received Christ. It's wonderful what God did to you through the word and making you a new creation. But it is very, very important that we live our lives in the word, that the word of God continues to sanctify us, continues to set us apart. Very practical. God is not, he doesn't, he is complicated from a finite perspective, but he puts it on our level. We can get it. And so what is necessary for us as believers, if we're going to be in the position we need to be, to get the gospel to the world, which is the command for each one of us, is that we are sanctified. And our sanctification takes place right here. I love the example that God gives us of the marriage. In Ephesians chapter number five, we're told husbands, what is it, ladies, husbands? Amen, that was weak. It was very weak. I don't believe you even believe it. <laughs> husbands? Love your wives, amen. Even as Christ also loved the church. You know, this is not a marriage passage. It's not a marriage passage. It's a passage about Christ and his church. Marriage is just sort of inserted in there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How do you know he loved the church? Because he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it. How? With the washing of the water by the word. Now, there's a marriage lesson in there. Our speech, husbands, has, how we speak to our wives, how we treat our wives, has very much an effect on the wife that we receive. Why does it say, um, this is it, this is free. This is that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be a holy and without blemish. So the marriage lesson in there the wife that you want is the wife that you, how you treat your wife. That's, I think that's fair enough to say in there. But 
here for the church. How is he sanctifying his church? It's through the word of God. The word of God. Sanctification is therefore the result of continually being washed, being changed by the word of God. Amen. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah was sanctified at that moment. Let's go there. I'll close with this. I wasn't planning on turning there, but we'll, we'll close with this. Isaiah chapter number 6. This is the, Isaiah writes, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. This is an amazing passage. In fact, in John chapter 12, Jesus refers to himself, saying, Isaiah saw his glory. This is Jesus that Isaiah is seeing in chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now leading up to this, the sixth chapter leading up to this, Isaiah's message to Israel is, Woe unto Israel. Six times. Woe unto Israel. Woe unto Israel. But the seventh time, number of completion, the seventh time, once he finally sees God for who he is, what does he say? He says, woe is, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Basic, just all of me. I'm unclean. So what's the answer? Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. This represents the Lord Jesus Christ, a sacrifice acceptable unto God. And he takes this coal, in verse 7, he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your, thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Interesting. God does a cleansing work in Isaiah. And only after God does this cleansing work in Isaiah, this sanctifying work, is he ready to hear the question, who's going to go for us? And is he ready to respond? I'll go. We see this in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you can read in your own time. This is speaking of the, the comparing the, the law, the, the, the Old Testament to the New Covenant. And he speaks of the New Covenant, and this is in connection with the Word of God. He says through it, through the Spirit of God, we are changed into the same image. As we're looking into the mirror of God's Word, we're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How does this happen? The Word of God. Dear Christian, this is not just an educational book. It's, it's not. How many, and, and we don't, I, I hate to, to give a wrong impression, we don't suffer like some of our brothers and sisters in Christ suffer in some places of the world, but there have been many lonely situations where this book, this has been the only thing that keeps us going. And to look at Christians who claim to know Christ and have no desire to go in the world, well, it's no wonder because they don't know the God of this book because they don't spend time with the God of this book. You see, dear Christian, if you are going to be fulfilled in what God has called you to do, which is to reach the world with the gospel, it is fully dependent upon your relation to this book. This book must be in you. And as the word of God gets in you, it sanctifies you and prepares you to go out and reach the world with the gospel. Let's pray. And I'm a, Dad, you can come. I'll pray and Dad will come. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for the Word of God. The Word of God that lives and abides forever. And Lord, that we can have a copy of the Bible 
in our own language, many copies. Lord, thank you that the, the word of God so powerfully works within us. When we hear it, it changes us. Lord, I pray that in this missions conference that we as a church would renew our commitment to live our lives within the pages of this book. Change us, Lord, into the image of Christ and make us fit to go into the world to preach the gospel of Christ. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Stand, please, 611, and we'll sing and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you. The altar will be open for you to come and talk to the Lord. 611, Brother Tom, would you lead us, please? 